God bless you guys. Before we get into today's message, I want to warn you in advance that some of the content in this series may be offensive at times, but that's okay because growth at times requires growth pains. Prolonged immaturity is arguably the most underestimated enemy of God-given destiny. It's time to mature. So get ready for mature audiences only. All right, all right, all right. Who's ready today? Well, I'm going to say welcome to everyone. Hello, church family. You guys look amazing. To everybody who's watching us online, we appreciate you checking us out. We believe that today God's got a word for your life. It's going to change you in a big way as you mature and become what God wants you to be. Amen? Well, let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and we're just going to saturate this moment with His grace and His goodness. Father, we thank you, God, for all that you're doing in our life. And God, we thank you that today... We stand in a place where our minds and our hearts are open to mature. God, we know we've not reached the full extent of how mature we can actually be in you. But God, today, today, God, as we have been doing for the last six weeks, we take a step forward, God, in understanding who we are in Christ and understanding our rights and privileges as sons instead of as servants. God, that we understand that everything that we have rests and revolves in you. And God, we rest in you and we trust in you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Now, in this series, it is all about maturing in our faith, or what we like to refer to sometimes as discipleship. When we're born again, as the Bible says, we're babes in Christ in 1 Corinthians. And therefore, a degree of spiritual immaturity is somewhat to be expected when a person uh, gets believing. As a matter of fact, uh, for a season, uh, you're going to have some immature people. How many of you know that in a, a church better have some immature believers? Because if you don't have any immature believers, that means you ain't reaching non-believers. Amen? So you need to make sure. we Non-believers is good. Think about this. Because that means if we got non-believers in the house or if we got um, immature believers, we're reaching people with the good news. However, the Scripture repeatedly cautions us against the dangers of remaining immature. Prolonged immaturity is arguably the most underestimated enemy of God-given destiny. It undermines your progress. It, 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 it hinders relationships. It perverts, uh, prevents us from realizing our God-given destiny at times. Remember, the level of your impact will rarely rise above the level of your maturity. Think about that. Truth is, the enemy, the enemy isn't really worried about a childish church. But the enemy is scared to death of some believers who get together and start growing up and start maturing and start getting committed to maturing enough so that they can carry, get this, carry the weight of Christ's authority. You need to hear what I'm about to say. Carry the weight of Christ's headship. Headship represents authority. A baby's, a baby's body, can I help you right now, is not going to be able to hold up my head. You put a man's head on a baby's body, it ain't going to work out, right? Come on, somebody. The enemy's worried about, about, about a child, is, is not worried about a child, but he is worried about a committed church. I want you to get this. Jesus came not only to save us, but get this, but to show us what we're capable of. Colossians 1 and 18 says this, He calls him the head of the body, the church. He's the head, get this, and we are the body. He came looking for a body to rest his head. That's why the scripture says the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have, have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lie his head. What were they talking about? There's no body that can carry my headship. There's no body that can carry my mind. That's why when he died and when the church began, we became the body of Christ so that we could hold the headship of Christ. The problem is, is an immature church don't, can't hold the authority and therefore we don't walk in it. We must go grow up in Christ. Must grow up in all things. Believers are maturing. When you know that you've been saved from something, uh, not just saved some, from something, but for something, you know you're maturing. When you know God brought you out to bring you back in, you're maturing. When you know you've been purchased and purposed, you know that you're maturing. Now, so far in this series, we've talked about what it means to mature in our message, 
mature in our minds, our mouths, our ministry. Last week we talked about a big one, maturing in our motives. And if you miss any part of this series, make sure you go back on the app and check it out. Now last week we looked at three attributes of a believer uh, 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 with a believer with a mature motives. Mature believers are motivated by love rather than ego. Remember that? Commitment rather than convenience. And giving rather than getting. Well, today is another big one. I want to pick up where we left off last week, and we're going to talk about the topic of maturing in our money. Y'all ready for this? We're going to talk about growing up and our money. Thinking right about money. We're going to be talking about money and maturing in it. 2 Corinthians. Go in your Bible. We're going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I love this. We're going to be breaking some of this stuff down. Today, you're going to walk out here free. How many is ready to be free? I'm going to free up your mind when it comes to money. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. Here's what the Bible says. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Wow. Will you do me a favor? Will you look down at your hands? Just look at your hands. Would you look at that? When you were an infant, you came out with your hands closed. You ever remember you take a kid, you put your finger in a baby's, in a baby's hand, what's that baby going to do? going to clutch it. They're going to grab it every time. Think about this. Uh, uh, and, and, then, and, then, and then the baby starts to grow up and becomes a toddler, right? When the baby becomes a toddler, then he's got his rattler in his hand and his pacifier in his hand. And he learns a new word, mine. And he's clutching it and he's holding on to it. And then when you get into elementary school, you hang on tightly to bicycle handlebars and and monkey bars and you're all the time hanging on to pencils and things. And then you break off into high school and you've got your hand clenched around a girl or a boy. And you're holding on tightly and not let go. My forever love. Think about this. And then you got to college, and you hung on to all kind of different stuff. Probably some stuff you really don't want to talk about right now. <laughs> but when you left, you were clutching a certificate with both hands, but you was excited. Then when you started your career, you grabbed the lowest rung of the ladder, and then, and, and then you, you, you held on real tight, and then you grab the next rung, and then you, you, you held on real tight, and then you grab the next rung, and then, then you held on real tight, and, and, and then all, all of a sudden you realize that you spent your whole life clutching and clinging at ladder rungs. And somebody, and then someday you'll retire. You know, and you'll sit there and you'll grab a hold of your hands around a golf club or a gardening tool or a social security check. <laughs> Or whatever it is. And then, and then when you get close to the end of your life, you'll, well, you'll grab a hold of a cane or, or a walker. You know? And then when you get right to the end, you'll clutch the edge of your hospital bed, hanging on for dear life to your last breath. And you know when you stop clutching? The day you die. The day you stop clutching, and that's the day you relax your grip, is the day you finally die. By nature, we, you and I, are clutchers. We like to hold on to things. We scrape, we claw, we work, we hustle, and we worry. And if we get ahead just a little bit, we hold on. Y'all, y'all must not be ready for this. It doesn't matter who or what tries to convince us or to relax our grip. We have a reflexive response to giving up something that's dear to us, especially if it's money. For most of us, clutching is like breathing. It just comes natural. Today we're going to learn why we need to mature in our money, why we need to grow up in our new nature and loosen our grips, and clutching is a major sign of immaturity. When it comes to money matters, putting your inner child in charge carries some pretty serious consequences, doesn't it? After all, debt, poverty, and and a steady diet of of, of hot pockets doesn't look good on a 38-year-old living in his mom's basement. Come on, somebody. Now, if you're ready to reinvent your financial life, you must start act, stop acting like a kid. A few money habits that you can look at to tell if you're immature in your money. Are you ready? I'm just going to give you this quick list. You can, please don't get offended. If, you, if your name is on this list, don't get offended. 
So if I call your name, first, last, social security number, and this is an address, Don't get mad. Are y'all ready? Heather getting upset. I'm a little nervous. But are y'all ready? If you, you might be immature in your giving if, in your, in your money if. You spend extravagant. You buy on impulse. You borrow from friends and families. You overdraw accounts. You max out credit cards. <laughs> you receive calls from creditors. <laughs> so I'm so sorry. If you're at home, just know we're having fun. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you receive calls from creditors, if you pay a bunch of late fees, if you constantly have your services cut off, if you groan, but still let your parents pay your bills. If you dodge the landlord as if he has cancer, you don't save nothing. And here's the biggest one all, you don't give. Those are the signs of immature believers. Today we're going to look at a church in 2 Corinthians and how they've learned to live and give with open hands. As they move from immaturity to maturity, they relaxed and they relax their grip. Now listen, I know childish people hate preachers talking about money. But it's a fact of life that we have to have money to be able to preach the good news and take this good gospel to the world. If God can get money through us, He can get money to us. But if we build up a dam and store it up, it hinders the flow. A lot of times we give like we're in a swamp instead of like we're in a river. How do you know if you're giving in a swamp or giving to a river? Is there flow? Because there should be flow of money in your life, a flow of resources in your life. If you're saying, you're, I'm struggling, you might be sowing into a swamp. Why? Because the money don't flow. You say, how do you know you're in a swamp? If you ain't got no boundaries and you ain't got no banks with your money. I got to get ahead of myself. If God can get money through us, he can get money to us. The Apostle Paul didn't see giving as a mundane manner. On the contrary, he saw it as it, as it relating to a few things. It relates to the grace of God, to the cross, to the unity of the Spirit. As a consequence, the church of Thessalonia and, Bers uh, 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 and Bersia, Berea, I've said the word 50,000 times, Berea, especially in Philippi, were famous for their generosity, generosity and their excellence in the grace of giving. Oh, could you imagine? What, what if we, Calvary Church, walked around and everybody recognized us? You know, that's that given church. That's that church that gives so much. That's that church that sows into the community all the time. That's that church that's generous. They must excel in the grace of giving. Man, would that not be a great reputation? Man, that's good right there. Think about that. Well, today we're going to have some grown-up talk, all right? We're going to do a verse-by-verse -verse teaching so that way you can't say I used anything out of context. And I want us to engage our thoughts on three kingdom realities as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want you to break this down. If you're going to mature in your money, we must consider the following. Number one is this. Mature giving is an expression of the grace of God. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 8 and 1. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian church. Look at the message translation. I love what it says in the message translation. Now, friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches of Macedonia. You'll notice that Paul didn't begin by referring to the generosity of the church of Macedonia. No, no, no. He refers instead to the generosity of God, to the grace that God's already given the Macedonian churches. In other words, behind generosity of Macedonia, Paul saw the generosity of God. Wow! Behind our generosity, we must see the generosity of God. Do you know that grace is another word for generosity? Our gracious God is a generous God, and He's at work within His people so that we can operate in His generosity too. chip off the old block. Like father, like son, we're fruit off the same tree. Come on, somebody. Look at four things Paul 
tells us about the way Macedonians give. Number one is the Bible says they gave joyfully. 2 Corinthians 2 and, uh, 8 and 2. Out of the most severe trial, their joy, overflowing joy. I want you to stop right there. There was joyful because they were, the, they were grateful for God's grace. Don't, don't ever forget, Jesus is grace and grace is Jesus. Amen? The law was given through Moses, and that was impersonal. But the grace and truth came through Jesus, and he made it personal. Grace is not a doctrine, it's a person. Grace is Jesus' nature. Because God's, uh, because God's a God of grace, the man they gave sacrificially. 2 Corinthians 8 and 2. This scripture right here has always blown my mind. Out of the most severe trial. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. I want you to get this. Paul's careful to show that it wasn't because of their prosperity or their wealth or overflow that the church in in Macedonia gave so generously. It was just the reverse. Paul says, out of their most severe trial, they gave. That's amazing. What do we do when we hit a trial? We get on our hands and knees, start beating the ground, begging, why God? Nobody thinks, hey, let's get up and give something. There's one time a Christian businessman went on a missions trip with a missionary. As they were walking along, as they were walking along, the missionary, the businessman saw two men out plowing a field. The first guy had the straps over his shoulder, and he was pulling the plow. The other guy, back on the back on the plow, he was putting it in the ground, you know, plowing it up. And the guy come by, man, that guy right there, some hard workers out there. They must be very, very poor not to be able to have to till the ground himself. And the missionary said, well, those two men out there are father and son. They're Christians. He said, in uh, last year, the church was having a fundraiser to raise money for the church so they could build them a new church. So those guys out there took their ox and sold it and gave it to the money of the church. And the guy said, man, that was a real sacrifice. He said, not to them. He said, they rejoiced so much that they had an ox to sell that they gladly got out and plowed the field, rejoicing the whole time because they had an ox to sell. I've never given any. Calvary family, God's called us to do plow work. Plow work locally and globally. All of us have an ox to sell. Question is, what's your ox? Can I tell you right now, money's not being remade. The money that's in the earth is in the earth. Not new money's not coming in. They might make some more, but new money's not coming. It's not leaving. It's all here. You You get this. There's no shortage of it. Money's everywhere. You have money. We all have money. You might think that you don't have enough, but it's not just a, but it's just a matter of priorities. Every person has something they can give. Sadly, many Christians have never given anything to God that involved any real sacrifice. The Bible says, and they gave joyfully and sacrificially, and then they gave enthusiastically. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3 says, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us, for the privilege of sharing in his ser- this service to the saints. Could you imagine? I want you to get this picture. I'm broke. I'm poor. I'm in the middle of a severe trial. Please let me give you money to support your ministry. Wow. That's big. I, I, I understand what the scripture says. Paul makes clear that grace is, is, is giving isn't so much a result of outward compulsion, but rather an inward release. In other words, it was their own free will. They, they simply wanted to say, thank you, Jesus. If we really had a revelation of how good the good news really is, we couldn't help but say thank you through the power of our giving. Thank you, Father, in Christ I'm unconditionally loved, thoroughly righteous, completely new, eternally accepted, totally forgiven, securely saved, remarkably royal, and greatly blessed, and that's just the beginning. Giving is a positive response by faith to what God's already done by grace. And they gave joyfully, they gave sacrificially, they gave enthusiastically, and finally they gave unconditionally. 
2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. And they did not do as we had expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. We, so we urged Titus, since he made uh, earlier, uh, he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion the act of grace in your part, on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in your love for us, see also that you excel in the grace of giving. Gracious giving is giving without condition. There are kinds of giving which actually is unspiritual because they have ulterior motives. We talked a little bit about that last week. It goes something like this. Our company is happy to support the work as long as you use our logo. You're not, they're not giving, they're selling advertisement. That's fine. If you're selling advertisement, that's great. I'm okay with that. But don't call it giving. Anyway, let me move on. It's fine with, 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 with giving something as long as you, as long as I'm recognized for it. Can you, get, can you make me a plaque? Can I get a plaque somewhere? Come on, somebody. I ain't got no help in here right now. I'm fine with giving something as long as I'm recognized. Jesus condemned this kind of giving. Think about this. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 4 that if you want to be rewarded in heaven, give in secret. Think about this. Kids love attention. My granddaughters, they'll get in the living room. Watch this. And it's dance time. It's concert time. Watch. And they'll get out there and they'll dance. And I can remember Kayla. Now, she might be all reserved now, but if she was a current little girl, let me go and tell her a little bit. <laughs> we walk in the living room. She'd come walking in the kitchen. She'd have her tutu on. She'd come in, I have a dance I want to show you. I'm like, by all means, let's see it. She's coming to me. She'd start dancing. Like eight songs later, she goes, <laughs> you, that's good, baby. I'm not through yet. <laughs> By all means, carry on. Why? She wanted attention. Why? Children love attention. Adults, mature, they give in secret. The Macedonian churches gave joyfully, sacrificially, enthusiastically, and unconditionally. Why? Because mature giving is energized by the grace of God. Secondly, is this mature giving is inspired by the cross. Second Corinthians chapter eight verse eight. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. The Corinthian church were, worried, were being com, uh, commanded to give generously, rather the sincerity of their love as being part of the test of, by comparison with others, and especially with the comparison with Christ. I want you to think about this. Do you know today how loved you are? Because if you understand how loved you are, generosity becomes easy. Do you know how loved you are? The Bible says he loved you so much that he became poor, so that you might become rich. He was made sin so that you could be made the righteousness of God. He was naked on the cross so that you'd be clothed with godliness. Watch this. He was cursed so that you might be blessed. He died in the dark so that you might live in the light. Come on, somebody. He cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we could cry out, my Father, my Father, why are you so good to me? He bore a crown of thorns, which represents the cares of this life, so that the cares of this life would never trouble your mind. He, he had his heart pierced so that your heart would never be broken. He drank sour wine so that your teeth would never be set on edge. His body was broken so that yours could always be whole. He bore the full blunt of God's judgment against sin so that you would never bear any of God's judgment against sin. The sweat, the, the sweat, great drops of sweat, that, so that he read great drops of sweat so that he would be freed from the curse of working for our spiritual bread. He defeated the devil so that we would not even have to fight him. You don't fight for victory, you fight from victory. And that's the ultimate reason we give because we're giving back. We're simply saying, my God, thank you, Jesus. We want others to be saved and set free too. I want to pause just for a moment and say right here, thank you to the amazing givers that these last 21 years has supported this ministry. Planted seed all over the world. You know, just this Thursday, Thursday afternoon at 12 o'clock, I was sitting on a computer and I was having my Zoom gospel circle with all my pastors in Kenya and Uganda. 
in Brundy. So literally, I'm sitting on a computer. Four nations are represented. In one sitting, I'm, in this, I'm, ready, I'm sitting there sharing the gospel with these pastors all over the world. Why? Because people in this room was generous, made a way. You say, well, pastor, it's free to use a Zoom call. You know, we pay for Zoom. But, but, but you say, well, that's, that's inexpensive. You don't understand. The Zoom call, the Zoom call is the icing on 15 years of sewing, of building relationships. Because every pastor that's on that screen, I know personally. I know their wives. I know their children. I know where they live. I've, had, I've been spent time with them over 15 years, spending time sewing into each other's lives because of you. You've made that available. You've made that possible. And you can imagine, your generosity made that possible. What's your generosity in the future going to make possible? <laughs> the Bible says, in the beginning, God created that which was good, and then he opened up his hands and he gave his new creation to man as a gift to be cared for. Man rejected that gift. And when Jesus came and saw the people's needs, he opened back up his hands. And with his hands, uh, uh, and, and with his hands, he taught, healed, loved, fed, and freed. And when, and when he was about to be nailed to the cross, he didn't hold on to his own life. He didn't uh, shake and clench his fist up towards the heaven. No, he opened up his hands and he gave. Think about this. The open hands of God was merely an outward expression of the inward reality of God's generosity. For God so loved, he gave. Are you seeing it? God isn't a clutcher. He loves to lavish his children with good things, and it's this lavishness that so, that so distinguishes his hands from ours. Do me a favor. Look at your hands. Do you like what you see? Do you wish your hands looked more like the hands of Christ? Well, you must first understand it is it isn't a hand issue, it's a heart issue. If God's gonna change your hands, he doesn't start there. He starts with your heart. Everything you do flows from the heart. And lastly, and certainly not least, is this. Number three, mature giving reflects our unity with the Spirit. Second Corinthians eight and ten says this, and here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now look at, look, let's look at verses 15, 11 through 15. Notice this. God honors integrity in giving. If you continue on to verse 11, you'll see Paul telling them to finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. <laughs> With great tact, Paul offers his advice to a church that had failed to keep a promise. They had raised their hands and pledged to give, but weeks had gone by and they'd forgotten about it. How easy it is for the distractions uh, to delay or to endanger the integrity of our giving. There's a big difference between, uh, between promise and performance. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 6, 8 and 6 you see the, the, the Corinthians had boasted to Titus a year before uh, uh, about they, they were going to sp- share in the special collection, but they didn't keep their promise. Immature people don't keep their promise. Many times we've all heard it. Uh, I love you, I promise. I'll, I'll be here for you always, I promise. Uh, Till death do us part, I promise. Paul teaches us that integrity before God is essential. It's right to make financial promises to God, and by doing so, we not only show our trust in God, but we also enable His church to advance and to plan ahead. Because think about this. The church would love to plan ahead instead of plan here. That's why we encourage you to set up reoccurring giving on the, on the app, and to give regularly and consistently. It helps us plan for the future. That's called mature giving. Children only care about instant gratification. Adults care about divine satisfaction. There's a big difference. If you're tempted to think, I can't make a promise to give because I don't know what my future circumstances will be, then remember that we live on the principle of pledging every day of our life into His. We live by the principle of do not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough words of its own. But, but know this, that I'm here for you today. Look at your past life. Has he failed you yet? I love what Angie told, uh, told Emma. Look, just look back. My God, he's never failed you yet. Think about this. Uh, we're tempted to, to think that, though. Uh, then remember that our lives are principles, pleasure in our lives every day. 
think about this. We see electricity, uh, we use electricity on the basis of a pledge every day of our life. We pledge to pay for that electricity. Well, yeah, we do the same thing with water, our cell phones, eating at restaurants, and taking an Uber, and, and we think nothing of it. Then why, do we, then why not plan on giving in the same way and trust God for the unforeseen circumstances outside your control? We may not know the future, but we trust the ones who's already in the future. So God honors integrity in giving. God honors ability in giving. 2 Corinthians 8 and 12 says, for if, the, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. God holds us accountable according to our ability. There may be people sitting in this room today that, you know what, giving $10 this week would be a struggle. And there's some people in this room right now that $10 would be no more like than, than, than flicking ash on the ground. Think about that. The test of generosity, therefore, isn't so much your wealth or your willingness. It, it isn't so much the amount, but our attitude. It isn't so much about money, but it's about our motive. That's why it's good to tithe on the, on the basis of your income. The word tithe simply means ten. Ron and I learned this principle many, many years ago. We trust God with our tithe every month, every week of every year. We trust God with our tithe, and then we trust Him with what's left over. We live within the leftover. We don't live, and then what's left over, God gets. God gets, and we live in the leftover. And can I tell you right now? A couple of months, me and Ronnie will celebrate 30 beautiful years of that smoking hot wife. 30 beautiful years. We've never, once, 30 years of marriage, ever said, can, do you, can I borrow? Can I have? Do you, do you, can, you get, can I get from you? Unless it's me borrowing something from Jay. <laughs> that I forget to bring back in terms. Uh, but all those years, we never went without. The kids never went without. They had enough and then some. But we put giving first. I can walk through this room right now and give you testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony of people saying, you know what, I gave first. I lived out of that, and here's what God did with my money. And finally, God, uh, God honors quality in giving. 2 Corinthians 8 13 says, Our desire is not that others might be uh, might be reviled rely, while you are on uh, are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written. He who gathers much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Paul further illustrates this point when he's talking about the man in the wilderness. They would gather up enough manna, and they were afraid, so they, they gathered up enough to have some left over the next day. Only realized when they did that, the next day it was all rotten. Why? Because Jesus said, trust me today. Trust me today. And so those who had, who didn't keep any manna left over had enough. Every day. Why? They trusted God and they believed that He truly was enough. How many of you want to be in a place to where you can say, I am a man or a woman of faith? Because that means you trust God. But you don't just trust God in an area. You trust God with your life. We like to trust God in the easy areas. In the areas that seem simple. But the complex areas, or the areas that require sacrifice or are difficult, we say, I don't know if I want to trust you in this. But here's the deal. You trust first. And watch and see You sit back and go, I had no idea. I had no idea that consistent giving would do this. But I'm living testimony. Jay's living testimony. Steve's living testimony. Chris's living testimony. Billy back there is living testimony. I I'm telling you right now, living testimony is what it means. Senior over is living testimony. Don't want nothing. Why? Because giving.
the truth about it. One thing's certain, if you live deeply enough in the sense of God's generosity, your hands will start looking like His hands. And all of a sudden, you will start, you'll start opening up your hands more freely. You'll start opening them up to a wider range of needs. You'll start saying, you'll start staying open you'll learn to, to perhaps the most surprising thing of all that open up your hands to become a, a visible expression of God's, of God's hands you become God's hand a hand uses you to do His will and your hands will be open and you'll be ready to receive more and give more and receive more and give more and receive more and give more and receive more and give more but the problem is we receive and we clutch a mature believer opens up their hands to receive all the I believe I have a church full of people who desire to be mature in every area. Some folks walk in the church, can't believe the pastor talking about money again. Let's not talk about money. I've not preached a message on money in a long time. What I'm saying is this. We can't leave it out. I can't leave out a part of your Christian experience, that, especially a part that will cause you to mature faster than anything else. Now, you want to grow up fast? You want to grow up quick in the kingdom? That's how you do it. You grow up in a hurry. Because you'll be an expression of God's love in the earth. That's what it means to be. It's to be an expression of His love. Amen? Stand it with me all over the house. Now stretch your hands towards heaven. This is it. We love you, Jesus. bless you right now because I believe I believe this year is a turnaround year for a lot of people but the creative juices are going to flow God's going to turn some things around your favor, the favor of God's going to begin to, to match your desires and all of a sudden you're going to see God move in a big way Father I declare right now in the name of Jesus I declare this room full of righteous believers this room full of believers, God, who is audacious enough to believe you and trust you in every area of their life. God, I ask you right now to release heaven over their lives, to bless them when they come in and bless them when they go out, to bless everything they put their hands to. I speak a creative spirit. I speak new businesses right now, Father. I speak right now that, that God, that increases on their job, God. I speak bonuses. God, I speak raises. God, I declare that in this season, God, that you would expand their territory, God. Properties coming to them, God. Whatever it is, God, that is lined up for them to have, release it even this year, God. God, that they can be able to taste and see how good you are, God. God, that they can be a part of the kingdom, God, that is responding to the needs of the church and responding to the needs of the kingdom, who's not afraid to step up and take steps of faith and leaps of faith and, and giant leaps of faith, believe in you for the miraculous and for the supernatural and believe in you for an advancement of the kingdom, God, that we may have never seen before, God. We're going to trust you and believe you by faith. And Father, we speak that over your people today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Somebody give God a big shout and a hand of praise. All right, we love you guys. Come back Wednesday night. Gospel Circus is going to be dope. Don't miss next Sunday, part seven of our nine-week series of maturing. God bless you guys.